protective form in blue. Um, after 10 years after infection, more than half the people are still alive. If you've got no copies of the infected form, um, uh, of the protective form, then only about one person in 10 or so is still alive. Africans who may have three or four copies do even better. 10 years after infection, something like 80% of those individuals are alive. So that's natural selection. People are now being selected out for having the wrong version of the actual gene. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a medical issue because part of the problem in Africa is prostitution and there are large numbers of women who are prostitutes who are infected with this illness and it doesn't seem to cause them much harm because they have this protected, protective variant, but of course they spread it. The, picture is, the story is even more interesting than that. We can go and count how many copies of this particular protective gene do different groups of humans have. Well, it's slightly complicated, I'll talk you through it. Non-Africans, on the average, have about three copies of this protective gene. Africans, who are in red there, on the average, have six or seven copies of the protective gene. And let's remind ourselves that the disease has been around in Africa for far longer than it has in the rest of the world. And chimpanzees, who must have got the disease long before, have got, on the average, about ten copies of the protective gene, which basically... Um, protects them from any harmful effects at all. So it's a perfect example of natural selection. It's often quite hard to uh, make predictions in evolution, but I think I can make one here. We're living through the crucible of natural selection today. We're suffering what the chimps must have suffered perhaps millions of years ago when the virus got into them. And if I were to come back, which I probably won't, a thousand years from now, and if we don't manage to master the disease in other ways, I can almost guarantee you that the average number of copies that humans in the future will have will be more than the average number they have today. So it's a prediction about evolution, which fortunately nobody in this room is going to be able to test. Um, but it's a really rather a striking example of natural selection. So that's what selection is. Okay? It's simple, it's straightforward, and it's demonstrable. Well, what about selection and us? Not just HIV. What about us and chimps, the shaved monkey business? Um, what about um, the, ch the chimp gem genome? Well, last November, as you might know, the chimp DNA sequence was, in fact, completed. Um, the, um, had to go with the human d uh, DNA sequence, which was completed a couple of years ago. In fact, it was completed two, three, and five years ago, depending who you were talking to and who was trying to sell shares in their company. But it has now been completed. And the chimp genome and ours are really rather interesting. We both have far fewer genes than we thought. We expected something like 25,000 of them. Uh, but there have been real changes between chimps and humans. Um, if we look at some of the differences between humans and chimps in the DNA and different chromosomes, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, the average deviation is about 1.5%. We're about 98% chimpanzee uh, in DNA sequence, which means less than you might think. Interestingly enough, um, women are more conservative, okay, and men are more radical. Women are more like chimps than men are because the X chromosome um, has, diver has, has diverged less than others, and the Y chromosome has diverged much more. Why that is, we don't know. Darwin himself noted that things to do with sex, like the peacock's tail, tend to evolve very quickly, and maybe this is something to do with what he calls sexual selection. Quite what it is, I don't know, but it's an interesting observation. Um, you can, one of the things which geneticists can do now is not just um, look at the machinery of the DNA, but to see it working. Which bits are switched on and which bits are switched off? And it's a very complicated question, I can tell you. Um, and it you can make a tree of humans and chimps based not on the structure of the genes, but on their activity. And what, one of the surprises is that actually, if you look at different tissues, the heart, chimp heart, and human heart, chimp kidney and human kidney, these are the trees, okay? Liver, chimp liver, and human liver. Well, the one that really, that really, um, stands out, is the testis. The essence of being human seems to lie within the scrotum as much as the skull. As you can see, chimpanzee testis and human testis are much more different in terms of gene activity than our um, chimpanzee brain and human brain, which is a bit of a surprise and a bit alarming, uh, but nevertheless seems to be true. Um, quite what to make of that, I'm by no means clear. There are various other surprises in the chimpanzee genome compared to ours. Certain genes have evolved very quickly it transpires that we have lost a lot of genetic information in our ability to smell and taste. Um, the biggest gene family 
in the human genome are the taste and smell receptors, that, which itself is a surprise. We still have many of them, but in fact, most of ours are damaged, perhaps because we depend much more on vision than, chimpanze than, than chimpanzees do. Um, other genes that protect against uh, disease have moved very quickly. Um, one big surprise is that the human genome has gained lots and lots of copies of some kind of foreign DNA that's got in there since the split from chimps. And there's been lots of insertions and deletions of DNA in the chimp and human genome. But if you look at the chimp and human genome, it's clear that the nature of the evolutionary process at that level is no different from the difference between cats and dogs, or fruit flies and nematodes, or plants and animals. There's nothing special about the mechanics of chimp and human evolution. However, if you look more carefully, I think perhaps we begin to see something quite startling about ourselves, which makes us very different from chimpanzees and indeed from everything else. Here's another one of those boring family trees, and I won't show you more. I think this is the last one. This is a family tree of the relatedness among, based on a certain kind of DNA, um, among uh, various kinds of primates. And we all fall in the same family. We're pretty close to chimpanzees. We're not very far from gorillas. We're a bit further away from orangutans. Neanderthals, surprisingly enough, um, were somewhat similar to us, but not very similar. Okay? So that's fine. So we are monkey shaved at the DNA level. But let's look a little bit harder at this. Actually, there's one thing very odd. We are by far the most boring of all primates. Okay? Those red lines, the length of the arm, represents the amount of divergence. Those red lines are different people, some of them from Fiji, some from Iceland, some from France, some from South America, some from China. And really, we're almost the same in our DNA. Compare that to chimpanzees, huge DNA differences from place to place. Indeed, the average genetic difference between um, the population of France and the population of Papua New Guinea, let's say, is less than the average genetic difference between two groups of chimpanzees living 100 miles apart in West Africa. So we're the primate that didn't evolve, at least in our bodies. But of course, uh, we evolved in another way. We evolved in our minds and in our societies. We're actually, compared to other primates, given us body size, about 10,000 times more common, more abundant, than we ought to be. Um, the natural population of the world, if you can use that, um, shouldn't be 6 billion. It should be about the same size as the population of Cambridge. Not necessarily the same people, I hasten to add. Um, but, you know, we were historically a rather rare primate um, who suddenly got very common, enormously common, and in fact killing off most of the primates as a result. Why? Well, the answer, I have to tell you, doesn't lie in the scrotum. It does lie in the skull. Here are some pictures of stone tools, in fact, of Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals, we all know, were related to us. They didn't, I don't think they interbred with us. They lived in Western Europe and in, around bits of the Med um, until modern humans appeared, something like 100,000 years ago, and they went extinct, and they made tools. Now, Neanderthals weren't very, um, weren't very ambitious animals or primates. These are tools from a Neanderthal dig, uh, which could have been excavated any time within the 100,000 years or so that they lasted in Europe. They were the first conservatives. They knew what they liked, and they stuck with it. Their tools didn't change. I will not make any cheap cracks about conservatives being the last Neanderthals. Um, modern humans then appeared. And here's an early modern human site from Western Europe. And you can see an absolutely dramatic shift in the technology. Um, all kinds of scrapers and bashers and pointers and God knows what. Something had changed. Something had changed in our brains. Um, and uh, in fact, what has changed was not the structure of our brain, but the way we are able to use it. We, in my view, and many other people's views, we are the primate, the mammal, that has stepped outside.